Hey everyone, welcome back from lunch. And I'd like to welcome, welcome Ollie to his talk, Making Hard Decisions from Influence Diagrams to Optimization here in day two of JuliaCon 2023. And I'll go ahead and pass over to him. Thanks. Oh, yeah, it works. All right. You might all be wondering, what, who is this grad student? What are influence diagrams? And so on. For the first question, well, that's not exactly the main topic of the presentation here. But uh, I'm Olli Herdala from Aalto University in Espoo, Finland. And then for the second question, what are influence diagrams? Well, let's start now after lunch with a quick engaging question. How many of you know or have a basic idea what influence diagrams are? Oh, I was hoping at least a couple, but no one. Well, influence diagrams are a structural representation of decision problems, often used in the field of decision analysis. We have three different types of nodes and then arrows drawn between them. The square nodes we call decision nodes. The circles we call chance nodes. And the diamonds we call value nodes. So decision nodes represent decisions. Chance nodes represent some uncertain event. And value nodes represent the consequences associated with these decisions and uncertain events. Then we have these arrows, also known as arcs, connecting these nodes. For example, in this very simple example case, we have an arc going from D to C, which in the case of a chance node means that the probability distribution of C is conditional on the decision made in node D. And then we have, for all chance nodes, we have the conditional probability distributions. And for all value nodes, we have the utilities or consequences associated with the other nodes. Those we have to define for the problem. OK, now that we have a basic idea of what influence diagrams are, I will hopefully show you why influence diagrams are nice. The main idea here is that they are easy to understand in, well, within the first three minutes of my presentation, I have hopefully given you enough information to grasp the pig farm problem from Lauritsen and Nielsen. <clears throat> we have basically four different types of nodes. We have the nodes H, which represent the health state of our pig. The pig can be either ill or healthy. Then we assume that we do a test on the pig to see if the pig is ill or healthy. And that test gives a possibly inaccurate result based on the state of the pig. And then based on that decision, or may, based on that test result, we do a test. Sorry, jet lag. Based on the test result, we make a decision on whether or not to treat the pig in that month. And then whenever we decide to treat the pig for the disease, uh, there's a treatment cost, and then in the end, we have some value for the pig. And a healthy pig, in the end, is much more valuable than a pig that is ill. So this is basically what we call a partially observable Markov decision process, represented as an influence diagram. We can see that, for example, there's an arc going from every H node to the T node, which means that the test result 
probabilities depend on the state of the pig, which makes sense. It would be a very bad test if the probability of getting a positive result would not depend on the health. Uh, there is no arc going from H to D, but there is an arc going from T to D, which means we do not know the health, but we know the test result when making the decision. And then the sort of transition function between the consequent months is this health state here is dependent on both the previous health state and our decision to treat the pig. I hope with this five minute introduction, you have seen how an influence diagram works and have the idea that they might be kind of easy to formulate. All right, so what's the backdrop for our presentation today? Drawing this diagram, determining the arcs, the nodes, and the probabilities and utilities associated with them is pretty easy. But then there's a bunch of traditional solution methods for these, which I will briefly go over later in the presentation. But those often have some very restrictive assumptions on the diagram. For example, many solution methods such as decision trees assume no forgetting, which this diagram does not satisfy. Uh, we would have to remember the previous testing, test results and at least the treatment decisions whenever we make a decision. Then many of them are specifically tailored for problems where we maximize expected utility. We might be interested in instead using conditional value at risk or some risk measure. Our goals for this presentation and the research that is behind it is that we take this influence diagram and we convert that into a mixed integer linear problem. And we should be able to consider different risk objective and constraints. For example, we have the conditional value at risk, which is commonly used. And then we have chance constraints, which could, for example, state that at each month there should be no more than 20% probability that the pig is not healthy. And then, well, why am I presenting this in JuliaCon? We wanted to put this into a very user-friendly Julia package so that everyone could take their favorite influence diagram and then solve it using this. So for the package to be user-friendly, the diagrams should be easy to create. It's easy to draw one, but well, we didn't go as far as making a function that takes a picture and then converts that into a diagram, but we tried to make the interface easy otherwise. And then once you get the optimal strategy, then you should also be able to somehow analyze it and see, for example, what's your utility distribution, what's the optimal strategy, those kinds of things. And then we finally get to the point, uh, the framework called decision programming. Uh, some prerequisites for understanding the MIP formulations that I'm going to present. Whenever I say MIP, I mean mixed integer programming. Uh, each chance and decision node is assumed to have a finite set of possible states. In our case, all of these have two states, the health nodes, either ill or healthy, test results, positive or negative, and decisions, yes or no. And then we call a combination of these states a path. So a path in this case would, for example, be the combination of the states from all of these nodes. So we would go, the pig is healthy in the beginning, the test result is positive, we treat, the pig stays healthy, and so on. So that would be a path. 
and then for each path we can calculate a probability. Uh, it's not too hard to calculate. For example, if you have the path that I described, you have the probabilities. So you can calculate a probability PS of that path happening. And then you can calculate the utility corresponding to that. So in this case, the utility would be treatment costs plus the final profit from selling the pig. And then we have local decision strategies, which we denote by Z. So the notation here means that we assume pure decision strategies, which means that we cannot have mixed strategies where the strategy would be if the test result is positive, treat the pig in 70% of the cases. So it has to be deterministic in that sense. So you have to pick one of the options, Sj, given what we call the information state, Sij, which is simply the states of the parent nodes. And we assume these Zs to be binary. Any questions so far before I go into the formulation? Okay. Mm -hmm. So basically, there is a probability associated with each U1, U2, U3, something like that. So are these probabilities only connected to the nodes that are all? Oh. Well, I can repeat the question. depending on D1, T1, and H1, is that it? Uh, yeah, so the question was that are the, if I understood correctly, that are the probabilities P associated with the utilities or something else? No, for instance, if I wanna check it out, for instance, the probability associated with U1. So is it only dependent only on D1, T1, and H1, just for me to, uh, so the probability of U1, for example, first, uh, the probability PS is the probability of the whole combination of the H, T, and D nodes okay. occurring. And in order to get the utility distribution for the individual utility nodes, we have functions for after you've obtained a strategy, you can obtain the corresponding distributions. So what is the purpose of having the connections then? So, The purpose of having what? The connections between the nodes. Uh, how does uh, the, the connection influence the probability in the end? The connections of the nodes describe the dependencies between the nodes. So for example, mm -hmm. if we have an arrow or arc going into a chance node, that means that the probability distribution in that chance node is conditional on the parent nodes, the nodes that have an arc going into that node. So basically using Bayer's law, Bayer's theorem to connect the... Yes, yes, okay. this is very similar to a Bayer's network. Okay, okay, thank you. Right, so then the, what we set out to do was convert this into a Optimization problem, we are, for example, we're gonna maximize expected utility, we could maximize something else or minimize, but this is a convenient example. Uh, we define the P of S given Z, which is the conditional probability of a path S given strategy Z. Because if we were to simply maximize the on the previous slide, we had that we can calculate the PS for all the paths. If we were to maximize PS times US, then we would also take paths that are not what we call compatible with our strategy. So for example, we should not take into account a path where we treat the pig in the first period if our strategy is never to treat the pig in the first period. 
So we need this construction to only limit ourselves to the paths that are compatible with our strategy. And since our z variables were assumed to be binary, we could just do that. We could have the product of the z variables. If the z variable corresponding to that path is zero for any of the decision nodes j, that would take the probability to zero. Otherwise, it's going to be ps. The problem is that that product of binary variables is not exactly linear. And we want a linear model for computational purposes. So we replace that product of binary variables with xs. And we linearize xs with a set of three constraints. So the objective function is to maximize the conditional expected value of strategy z. Uh, the first constraint simply states that we have to pick one of the alternatives in each decision node. And the three others, constraints three to five, they make sure that our variables x behave the way they should. So x is zero if any of the z variables are zero, which is enforced by this. x is between zero and one. And this constraint here, constraint four, makes sure that if our z variables are all one, then our x variable also has to be one and we're actually computing the correct expected value. All right, so Julia package that we created, it's been developed in Aalto University by, well, a couple professors came up with the idea, a couple PhD and grad students and summer trainees have been working on it. It's available on GitHub and the Julia package manager. Uh, our beautiful idea in the package is that we separate the influence diagram and the model. And the good thing about that is that if we figure out a better way to do the influence diagram interface, we can change that without touching the model. If somebody wants to develop a graphical user interface for that, please let me know. I'm not good at that stuff. And then vice versa, if we find better formulations for the mixed integer formulation, then we can just add those and solve the problems faster. Uh, it's built using jump. So you can use all the familiar jump variables and constraints if you are familiar with using it. Uh, going over the pig farm problem, it's implemented as an example problem, and you can also find it in the documentation, which looks like this. It seems like I don't have time to go over it in much detail, but basically you import decision programming. In this case, we specify that we have four stages in the problem. You create an influence diagram, add nodes, here we don't add the probabilities yet. We just add a node called H1. It's a chance node with an empty information set. So there's no nodes influencing that node because it is the root node and two possible states and so on. We generate the diagram. We add the probability distributions. Uh, we generate the diagram the structure that we need for our model. Then we create an empty jump model, add the decision variables z and the path compatibility variables x, give it the expected value objective function, solve the model. We can get the decision strategy. In this case, the optimal decision strategy was to not treat in the first period and then continue by treating if the test result was positive then we can do all kinds of stuff like state probabilities where we can get the probability, given this strategy, the probability of the big being healthy or ill in each of the health nodes. 
the probability of the test result being positive or negative. We can get the utility distribution. So the most probable outcomes are very high utilities. There's also a possibility that the pig is ill despite our treatment. Then some statistics. But yeah, we have a documentation that covers the pig farm problem and a couple other examples. So if you are interested, you can check that out. Then some conclusions. Uh, we have different methods. We can do the traditional stuff using decision trees or manipulating the influence diagram. You can reverse arcs and remove barren nodes. I'm not an expert on that. Uh, these often have the no forgetting assumption, which means that when making decisions, you should remember the whole history of the process. They often assume expected utility maximization, which oftentimes is good enough. But then again, sometimes you might want something else. Uh, if you use decision trees, the trees quickly explode. I think many of you might have done decision trees on some basic decision making course. And they get quite big quite quickly. We have different heuristics. For example, single policy updates. You go over all your local decision strategies, see if you can improve locally, and then end up with a strategy that is, in a sense, locally optimal. Uh, in the general case, these obviously have no guarantee on optimality since they're heuristics. Then we have our decision programming, where we start with an influence diagram, convert it into a MILP. Uh, we can do different objectives, constraints. We can add stuff from like mixed integer programming side. We can add valid inequalities to make the formulation stronger. We can come up with other formulations. Uh, the problem here that I did not want to start with was that this formulation that I presented here struggles even with smallish problems. And some of you may already know why. We have a path compatibility variable and a bunch of constraints for each path. And paths are combinations of states. So that number grows exponentially with the number of nodes. Not great. Then the savior. Recently, there's also another paper on converting influence diagrams into mixed integer problems by these French guys. I usually avoid pronouncing French names just to avoid upsetting all the French people. But you can see the name there. Um, they present an alternative reformulation, and the computational performance is just in a different league. But since we made a very smart package, our sort of next step is to incorporate the ideas in that paper and make our package faster. OK, so I presented this system programming, which with this formulation doesn't solve large problems. Why am I presenting this? The main points here are that we have a package that makes the process easy. That's something the other approach doesn't have yet. Uh, then something that might seem like a very random remark on the concluding slide, the package is, I hear, used for teaching in Rio. I just had a colleague visiting Rio this spring. And why do I state this? As we heard in this morning's keynote, we do not always want to raise the roof. We might want to raise the floor. So we want to make it easy for undergrads to understand how you solve influence diagrams or be able to solve them. Uh, then we use jump. So it's pretty easy to improve the performance by adding stuff or changing stuff. 
Yeah, that's all for me. I could go over some references. There's the paper introducing limited memory in flat diagrams, big farm problem, the original decision programming paper, uh, a nearly finished preprint covering most of the stuff I talked about today. I put it on archive the day before yesterday, so it is there now. Uh, and then the better MILP formulation. Thank you. I think we'll ah, Yes, thank you very mm -hmm. much. Anyone have any questions? two questions. I don't know if we have enough time, but uh, I was taking a look at your code here, and, and I see that you use multiple structs to define this object style a slash struct mm -hmm. call influence diagram. I wonder why did you make that decision? Because you could also write alter constructors and define each node before hammering down on, definition, on the definition of influence diagrams. And the second question is, I don't know much about mixed interior programming. Um, but I imagine that is some kind of linear programming in uh, mm -hmm. high constraints. Uh, why did you have to use it for these kind of influence diagrams and stuff? Uh, that's, these are the questions. So the first question was about why did we use structs for representing? Mutable structs, not immutable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we can take that after. I think we don't have time to discuss that here. Okay. <laughs> but um, for the question, why do we use MIPS? That's a very good question. Uh, basically, in the past 20, 30 years, uh, based on my understanding, I'm too young to know about things 15 years ago, but mixed integer programming was thought to be like this very slow thing that doesn't work, much like neural networks. But recently, there's been some computational advances, and now it's actually pretty efficient, despite on paper being NP hard. Thank you. Uh, er everyone else good? Uh, we'll have our next talk starting in just two seconds. <laughs>